Hi, my name is Molly Sanders, and I've been horse crazy from birth. I've spent my life helping people from my years in the classroom to becoming a horsemanship instructor, and now as a facilitator of online learning experiences. My journey has been filled with twists and turns, some of them bringing moments of elation and others humbling me to my core. One of the most powerful tools that has helped me along the way is talking to people I admire and finding out how they navigate the twists and turns of the journey. My goal of this podcast is to bring you conversations from a variety of horsewomen and men to help you on your journey. I'm grateful you're here. Welcome to my first podcast. I'm really excited that you're here. And I'm also excited to share with you this conversation that I had with my first podcast guest, Linda Pirelli. Something I've been thinking a lot about lately is how important it is for all of us to share our unique gifts with each other, with the world, and how easy it is to get held back from doing that, from different fears that we might have, what ifs, what will people think, I'm not good enough, all of those things that it's so easy to get wrapped up in and then we don't share what makes us unique and the gifts that we have. When I come across someone that has pushed past all that and is sharing their gifts, I just feel so grateful. And that is Linda Pirelli. So I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. You're gonna hear about her new curriculum that is helping people all over the world. You'll also hear a little bit about how she got started and how this horsemanship journey has not always come easy for her, as well as some tips for your own practice sessions. I'm really glad you're here. Let's listen to the conversation. I am so excited that you're here listening or watching, and I want to tell you a little bit about our guest today, Linda Pirelli. Um, She's one of the most passionate educators I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, Her dedication to improving her own horsemanship, along with her enthusiasm to help horse lovers around the globe, is not just a career, it's the way she lives her life. And if you've spent any time around her, you'll quickly see that she's constantly thinking about how she could improve what she's doing with her own horses and how she can help unlock things for her students. It's phenomenal. Uh, A couple of fun facts about her. Her first concert was the Beach Boys. A favorite book of hers that was super influential in her 20s was Anne Rand's Atlas Shrugged, where uh, she says fiction meets philosophy. And her first horse was named Radar. He was a crazy little dappled gray three-quarter Arabian pony, and they went everywhere together and jumped everything in sight. Uh, She's one of my favorite people, and I'm so excited she's joining us today. So welcome, Linda. Hi, Molly. Yay! What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I mean every word. Uh, it's been such a pleasure for me to get to know you over the years, one from being an instructor, um, in the, in the Prelly program, and then getting to do the virtual events with you. Um, it just, you're, you're really quite a impressive person and I'm feel well, fortunate to know you. The feeling is mutual. As you know, we have, we have this mutual admiration society. Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. Yes. I'm so glad you're joining me. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about your little crazy dappled gray pony. Um, like how old were you when you got him and what's the story? Like, how did he come into your life? I was 12 and my family had recently moved from Australia to, I mean, from Singapore to Australia, because I was born in Singapore. And um, I was horse crazy from the moment I can remember the earliest memories. And uh, when we got to Sydney, there was horses in the neighborhood. I lived in Mona Vale. And uh, there was, you know, horses being tethered out in fields and things like this. And so I started bugging my parents, you know, that I really wanted a horse and, you know, please, 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 please. And then one day my dad said, if you ask me one more time, I'm not getting you a horse. So that meant I was getting a horse, right? So um, I started looking and I found this pony in my neighborhood 
and uh, he was a little bit wild. And of course, I was instantly attracted. And uh, we just became firm friends. And I rode him everywhere, bareback, bridalist, totally out of control. Um, you know, I had a little saddle and bridle and I went to the local pony club and I competed in everything. I rode him on the beach. I took him swimming. I mean, it was a dream come true. That's so great. That was AR. Yeah. That's great. And were you the only one in your family that was horse crazy? I was, I was the only horse crazy one, but both my sisters also rode a little bit, but you know, they weren't as manic as I. Great. That's awesome. So it, you know, the horse crazy part is one of the things that brings us together. The people that are listening, um, we're all, I think we can all relate to that. Um, and the desire to be better for them, which can be a really challenging thing to continue to progress and continue to learn and learning can be hard. Um, can you tell us about a time in your journey where you were faced with a challenging learning situation and what did you do to get through it? Yeah, I mean, I, I was filled with those. <laughs> My life with horses was filled with cha uh, challenging situations because I had no knowledge about horses. I, I could ride just mm -hmm. about anything, um, you know, and I had accidents, but I was just kind of brave. And, you know, if the horses were really frisky and difficult to control, I was kind of proud of that. You know, it's like, oh, look, I can ride these wild horses, but they're out of control, you know. So it wasn't until years later that I realized that was a bad reflection on me. <laughs> but I never I never thought of that. I just thought, oh, it's, you know, it's a wild pony or it's a very difficult horse. So um, it's interesting when you talked about or you mentioned, you know, that we want to be better for our horses. That never occurred to me until I started natural horsemanship when I met Pat and went to that first clinic with him in 1989. It was because I had a thoroughbred that basically was trying to kill me and I wouldn't give up on him. And he was right brain, he was terrified, but everybody told me that, you know, he was a bad horse and that I needed to discipline him more. But, you know, if I ever smacked him, which I think I did once, he, com he as you can imagine, he completely lost it. And I just didn't want to give up on him. So I, you know, I can identify so much with people who struggle and yet they won't give up on their horses because that was me. And it makes, it makes me think about it. It's like, why after you fall off, you come home crying after every dressage lesson, you know, you're out of control most of the time. It's frustrating. Why do you not give up? And it's because you're passionate about it. You know, it's beyond logic. So that was me. Um, and I really struggled because I was trying to do dressage. Um, I was trying to do eventing, actually, which involves jumping and cross country. But the horse was so out of control that the instructor said to me, you'd better focus on dressage for a while. And I remember thinking, dressage, that's so boring. You just ride in circles and, you know, it's only scared people. But all of a sudden, I got very interested in dressage. <laughs> And so um, then I found out how challenging it was, you know, that it wasn't just riding in circles and, you know, for people who are afraid um, that, it, and I became really passionate about it, but I was passionate about it and my horse wasn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Pat was the one who said to me, you know, I know you're really interested in dressage, but he said, that's a very refined sport. And he said, you have nothing to refine. Right. <laughs> I was like, yep, <laughs> ouch, <laughs> ouch, but the truth. And, you know, that's where my horsemanship journey started. Um, you know, I, I often would tell the story of how I wrote down everything that was wrong with the horse when I went to that first clinic with Pat because I'd been to so many trainers and nobody could help me. And it's like, this is my last chance. But I want all these problems, you know, fixed. And so when, <laughs> when uh, he finally asked me about my horse, um, everybody else had said there's no, they haven't any problems. And then one lady said, well, sometimes I can't catch my horse. And Pat said to her, well, have you ever looked at it from the horse's point of view? And that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh my God, I never did that. And at that time I was working in education and sales and marketing. And a lot of what I was doing uh, in my presentations because I was doing a lot of teaching and seminars um, I had really learned how to 
relate to people and consider their point of view, which I never used to do before either. And so when he said that, I couldn't believe that I didn't do that with a horse. I did it with people. Right. But I never did it with a horse. And when I thought about why, I realized it was because I didn't know horses. I could ride them, but I didn't know how they think or learn or what's important to them. Didn't know they were a prey animal. I mean, it was a huge window that opened up for me. And uh, luckily, I had a lot of things that I was already doing that I could attach to it because it was very similar. I was studying NLP and, you know, a lot of natural horsemanship, the way Pat teaches it is, you know, it's kind of like NLP with horses. And, and so what, what, how, do you, would you define, how would you define NLP for folks that don't know? Neuro-linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about communication and connection and matching and mirroring. So, you know, a lot of people, when they've got a really um, dull horse, they get over animated. So the horse's energy is here and their energy is here and it's a total mismatch. So it actually makes the horse worse or vice versa. The horse is really like super animated and you're very quiet and calm. There's also a mismatch. So in NLP, you really learn how to match Pay, match mirror and then pace and lead and so I had been learning about those kinds of things and the power of words and relationships and body language with people and never thought about it with horses so that made the connection and then it was a very um, fast bridge for me because I'd already been studying that in another mode that's super interesting. And because one of the things that I've heard, and then in my own life as well, so much of what I've learned with horses relates to other things. And for you in that situation, you were realizing that so many of so many of the things that you were learning in your other world completely related to horses. So it opened up, opened exactly. up that world for that. Exactly. And then I had to learn about horses from the inside you know how do they think how do they feel why do they do what they do and that became a lifelong study and, and passion for me and of course because I was already a teacher uh, that part of it came very naturally to me to then share it right right which you're like I was saying in the introduction you know when you when anyone is uh, gets to be around you you know, whether it's like this or seeing you in person, um, you really do, you're thinking about how to um, help someone um, even when you're not there with them or okay. you're thinking about how to help your horse. I mean, it's, it's constant um, and it's really, it's really inspiring to see that that really is who you are and, and how you live. Um, so. It is, you know, it's not a job, it's me, you know, right. I, I want to help people and I want to explain things and I want to make things easier. And, you know, I'm not a talented um, horse person. You know, people think I am, but that's skills, <laughs> that's skill development. Um, and sure, there was a certain amount of athleticism and balance, but still those are skills that I learned. Um, but my real talent is teaching. Right. And so, you know, that part of it comes so naturally and easy for me. And I have studied it as well. You know, I've had great mentors like uh, Dr. Stephanie Burns and Robert Kiyosaki that, you know, really um, helped to shape my talent, you know, add the kind of skills and awareness to the talent. Because sometimes when you're talented in something, you can, you still have no idea, you know, what you're really doing. So right. you need both, you need the talent and the skills. And so um, that's, you know, when I started teaching, that was really, I saw that that was my future. That's, you know, that's what I'm going to be. <laughs> well, I'm, so, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> Me too. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I have a question um, about something you were sharing with the mismatch with, uh, with the NLP that's designed for people to learn how to match people, right? It's more of a people uh, relating to other people training program. Um, and then you said you related it to what you were seeing with horses. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that are listening might go, Oh, wow. Yeah, I can relate to that. I think I might have a mismatch, whether it's a big one or a little one. What would you, what, what advice would you give to them? How do they, um, get better at? Well, I, 
you know, I mean, I've been teaching for 30 years now. And, uh, and honestly, I get better, not every year, I get better every day, because, you know, that's something that I'm constantly evolving. And um, since I've been out on my own, and really free to, to teach, you know, in in ways that I see are needed, the biggest missing piece was connection. And yet, as horse people, that's the thing we crave the most. Like we want to connect with our horse and we want our horse to connect with us. And there's a big gap there. And so when it comes to connection, like that's number one in my new curriculum, connection, then relaxation, then responsiveness. Um, and they all kind of hover around the same, you know, like you need to do all of them, but that connection piece is probably the most profound. And, you know, um, people would think, well, if I'm just nice to my horse or I do, you know, kind of friendly game stuff, then my horse is going to relax and he's going to connect to me. But that's not necessarily the case. Connection uh, comes because the horse sees you um, and can relate to you. So if, um, if, for example, let me just, how can I make this um, really easy to understand? A lot of the time, people go in to the paddock or to the stall and they get their horse and they put the halter on and they rub it or whatever. And then they just start. But what they've missed is all the things that happened from the time that horse saw you approaching the stall or the pasture and open the gate. And then how did you connect with them? Did they connect with you? Did you have to catch them? Did you have to go up and get them? Or did they come to you? And then what's your energy like compared to theirs? Because horses really read energy. So if you're a high energy person and you approach a horse that's kind of a, you know, mellow or okie dokie, you have immediately broken rapport because that horse sees you. I mean, it's like introvert and extroverted people, you know, an extrovert kind of bowls into the room and the introverts are like, oh my God, it's just too much. <laughs> and that's what happens with horses and vice versa. Because if you're a very low energy person and that horse sees you coming and it's a high energy horse, they're going to go, mm you know, it's already a mismatch for them because they're so tuned to that. And people should be too, but we are so verbal and so direct about, you know, what we want to do that we don't tune into that part. So that's the first thing I teach people is how to manage their energy and how to match their horse's energy. And when you match the horse's energy, things change. The testimonials I've been getting, let alone the things that have happened in the clinics that I've been teaching have been just really exciting Be just by changing that one thing. And then how do you maintain the connection? Because a lot of the time a horse will get uh, disconnected and we don't do anything about it or we disconnect. Right. And we're expecting our horse to stay connected, but we're not connected. So there's a lot of awareness around that that I'm teaching that, you know, it doesn't matter what level a person is, they can get it and make an immediate shift with their horse. That's great. So I'm I'm smiling a lot of times when you're talking about the extrovert meeting the introvert because I <laughs> do tend to have a lot of energy. And um, so I, I'm thinking of one of my horses that's particularly introverted. And, you know, I'll often go with all these things in mind that I want to be doing. Um, so what, like, if I, if I go into the pasture and I, you know, I see him um, standing and bringing my energy down and waiting, like, what, what would that look like? And what would I, how would I know that I can move on? Okay. So what does your horse do when you come in the gate? Uh, he tends to, he'll usually look up at me. Um, and then often go back to what he was doing. And is he right brain or left brain? Left brain. Okay, so then I would play games with him. Is he extrovert or introvert? Introvert. Okay, so I would I would play games with him. I would, you know, go and do something very different than what he would expect. So you like you remember my horse Remmer? Mm -hmm. uh, if ever he did that, I'd go and hide behind a tree. And then he'd be like what happened to her? And it would pique his curiosity because with left brain horses, they're often so far ahead of us. They've already calculated everything. If she does this, I'll do that. And if that happens, I'll do, you know, and right. so do something a little bit different will really work. Uh, if it's an extroverted horse and they don't come to me, then I'll run at them. Okay. Playfully and chase yeah. them. And then they're right. like, Woo! and then uh -huh. 
Yeah. Yeah. Quick, they see you and they just come to you, you know. Right. But if we go up and we're all soft and, you know, they're like, mm. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just something as simple as that. If it's a right brain introvert, then I would probably pick up, you know, little pebbles as I go or pick flowers as I go, as if I'm ignoring the horse and then end up near the horse and sit down and ignore it. Okay. You know? And the, it, it shouldn't be like that every day, but on the first couple of times, if you do it, then by the third or fourth time, things have changed. Okay. That's really good. And so that's with, kind of an idea, you know, it's, it's not really a lesson for you, but it right. just get you thinking along those lines of, you know, because even, you know, my horse jazz mm -hmm. and, you know, he's a right brain introvert. And I mean, horribly introverted. I thought I was going to kill myself in the first two years that I owned it. I, mean, I was like, I don't know if I can do this, but it was the best thing that ever could have happened to me from a, a learning point of view. Um, because I had to walk so slowly and I had to wait so long for him to breathe after I asked him to do something, you know? Um, but in the end it paid off and he, he's fairly extreme. Most people wouldn't realize that, but he is fairly extreme, you know? Right. So learning how to bring my energy down and not have expectations and not get impatient and be happy to do one thing that day. Right. It's massive, but right. look now, I mean, he's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. So. And I, I can imagine that that exercise that you did that was, you know, really challenging and it, you put a lot of time into it. Um, the, the practice that of you managing your energy and finding what did that mean for, for jazz? Like how low did the energy need to come? How long did you need to leave it there? Right? Like, I'm sure that's applied that change that you made in yourself. I'm sure you've been able to reach for that now as you yeah. progressed. Whereas if you yeah. hadn't done that, that would, it wouldn't be available. So. Exactly. You know, there's, there are all the big lessons that you learn and, you know, what we have to be able to do as horsemen and women is have a range. You know, a lot of people just have one way and they do the same thing with people. This is just me, like it or lump it. It's like, well, you're going to have trouble with certain relationships if you're just like that all the time. You know, relationship is about relating. So can you relate to that person? Can you relate to that horse instead of just going, well, this is me, like it or lump it. Well, guess what? They're going to lump it a lot, you know? Right. So it certainly increased my range because I was being an extrovert myself. I was pretty good at the extroverted range of energy, but when it came to the introverted, it was like, wow, did I learn a lot? Cause I thought I was slowing down. Right. But the more that I read my horse and, you know, saw his feedback on things, I knew I wasn't even close. So in those years that I really had to learn that, uh, which is many years ago now, you know, it's probably about, like how old jazz and jazz is 14 now. So this is maybe nine years ago, nine, 10 years ago. And, uh, but then I, I could adapt very quickly. Like once you know how to do that, you can access it very quickly. So whenever I meet a horse, I'm very quickly reading its energy, where it's at mentally, emotionally, physically, because they can be different in their energy mentally versus physically like a left brain introvert, for example, very fast mentally, slow physically. Interesting. Right? And it's the hardest one for people to match. Well, and that, that really, because I've, I've, I've learned a lot of this through the years, but what you just said there kind of tweaked my brain because when you said not only matching them physically, but also mentally, I don't think I've ever thought of the mental part, especially with my more, left brain introvert horse i've always thought about matching him physically slow but not the mental side it's so. like this so interesting right so you're really strategic you know you've got a plan and you're going to do but then physically you're going to take your time right and that engages the horse right you know quite often if we slow down physically we also slow down mentally and then you cannot relate to that horse. That's really interesting. Cause even in what I asked you about approaching him in the pasture, 
in the past, I have played around with just waiting there and, and being more relaxed until he got interested. Well, he didn't, I didn't have the, I didn't have the strategic part. So even there where you said, well, go hide behind a tree. I was like, I've never thought about doing that. I know. And then what you do, it's so fun because they, they start to go, what, what happened? And now you've got their mind, right? And then you look around from the tree, you know, and they're like, what's going on? And then you go to another tree and pretty soon that horse comes up to the tree and goes like, where are you? Right. Now that's only one strategy, of course, sure. different ones. But if you talk about then like right brain introverts, they are slow physically, but they're very fast emotionally. And a lot of people think they're not smart but it's because the emotions are in the way. So once you can get the emotions down, then of course they're smart, you know, but it's like with people and you're a teacher, you know, this, if students are stressed and tense, they don't learn well. Right. So that's the same thing with more right brain horses. Right. So you don't need to match them emotionally, but you need to know that that's got to change before you can ask anything of them mentally, let alone physically. Right. And I'm just thinking if, you know, if, if we have folks listening that aren't familiar with the left or right, um, it's just basically left brain is more on the confident side, right brain is more on the unconfident side. And then yes. introvert doesn't really want to move their feet. Extrovert wants to move their feet. So, I, I mean, I did all that work, um, you know, for Pirelli Natural Horsemanship when I was all a big part of that. And, um, you know, there's, it's a huge body of work if anybody wants to study it. Um, but then I've also developed another tool that's very um, uh, immediate, immediate, and it's a behavior fixed tool. So instead of really studying about introverts and extroverts and right brain and left brain, it just gives you an action plan. So if, it's, if you have a mover or a stopper, that's an extrovert or an introvert. And then if you have a horse that's pushy or tense, that's left brain and right brain. And so I found that, you know, cause I'm working with a lot of people that don't know any of this stuff. And so I had to make things very simple for them to understand. And so now, you know, is your horse more of a mover or a stopper? It's like, oh, well, he's a stopper. And you go, then is he more pushy or is he more tense? Oh, it's more tense. Well, now, you know, it's a right brain introvert. Right. And then there's strategies. If it's tense, here's what you need to do. And if it's a stopper, here's what you need to do. And usually it's the opposite of what you want to do. But it gives you three things immediately that will work. And then there's a couple of other things that give you alternatives as well. That's great. That's really yeah. great. And very, cool tool. very cool. And how, how can people access that tool? Well, funny you should ask, Molly. Um, <laughs> I, out of my new curriculum, um, I, it's a 10-module curriculum. And the first three have been released. Number four is coming out um, I think in the next week or two. And then I'm, I'm just producing each one as I go because there's only one of me, but there's 10 modules. And so um, I set it up as a heart. I can give you a schematic of it if That'd you'd like great. to put it in. Yes. But it's a heart uh, because I started it, you know, when I was developing the curriculum, I went, you know, I, I like forming things from the bottom for some reason, you know, it's oh. like, this is the core and then these build on top and then these build on top and then you get to this. And I had it sitting on a flip chart where I was just looking at it all the time and thinking about how am I, you know, developing this curriculum. And all of a sudden I went, oh my goodness, if I just put a thing on the top, it's a heart. And I went, that's, that's the heart of the program. And, you know, we're trying to get to horses' hearts. And so it all just kind of came together for me. So at the bottom is connection. Then the next two are relaxation and responsiveness because those have to go hand in hand. You can't just go, I'm going to work on relaxation for a month because you might have a horse that goes, you want to do relaxation? I'm bored and I'm going to buck you off, right? right. So lacking responsiveness. So those two kind of go hand in hand. And then the next tier, so now that's the first tier, second tier, then there's a third tier. And the third tier is confidence, impulsion, and bending. And then the fourth tier is um, harmony, agility, purpose, and power. So what I wanted to do, because, you know, the Levels program, uh, you know, is a fabulous program. I, I helped develop that. Uh, so I know how good it is. And I didn't want to do something that was the same as that. I mean, it's already good. Why, you know, why 
try to better that. Right. And so the way that I've gone has been more the horse training route, because as I was traveling and doing clinics, I would see that people, you know, knew all the theory uh, and c- could play all the games, but they weren't reading their horses and they didn't know what they wanted to do. And they didn't even know what they were missing. So, you know, they didn't know if they were missing connection. They didn't know if they were missing relaxation. And even if they did, they didn't have the formula of what to do. So that's what I'm doing in my program is I'm teaching you how to read it, how to know when you've got it, how to know when you don't have it, and then what to do to fix it and achieve it. And so there's about uh, between, I would say, eight and 15 lessons in every module. And it's got videos and how to's and pictures and all kinds of things. So there's people that are doing it at the same time as they're doing levels. And then there's people who are just doing that, you know, but it's very complimentary because it's, it's about horse training. It's not about personal development, even though you will become a better leader and a better communicator by doing this. Right. Right. That's, that sounds amazing. So it sounds like it's, it's a diagnostic tool um, and to really help you like you said, learn to read the horse. Um, and so when when people start out in the connection module, do you do you recommend that people start with the with the first one? Is it kind of sequential or can be okay, great. I do. I mean it is sequential. I've numbered it mm-hmm. one to ten. And uh, but the thing is because it's so behavior oriented, it's not like um, well, I'm going to wait six months before I work on impulsion. It's like, let's say that you you just start my program and impulsion isn't out yet, but mm-hmm. let's say it was, and that's number um, five. So you would go, oh, good, I'm starting to read all this stuff, but really this is where my problem is because I, I give you a little um, list of symptoms to know what the problems are. Mm-hmm. And then you could go, oh, my gosh, that's my biggest problem is impulsion. Well, if you go to that module right away, it's going to help you fix some things instantly. But then you should still go back and do connection, relaxation, responsiveness, and work through all those things. That's really cool. So if so, you have... Uh, Linearly and circularly, you know, right, that you right. can get what you need to. And then in the end, like you said, it's kind of a diagnostic tool where you go, you know, what's the problem? And that's one of the things that I, re- I really teach people how to read horses and go, what does that, what does that horse need? So, for example, um, I was teaching in a master class uh, a few months ago and I said, um, so uh, if you looked at this heart diagram that's got all those words in it, um, if your horse was rearing, what would you, where would you say the problem is, which module would fix it? And everyone's going, oh, it's relaxation or it's impulsion or it's connection. I was like, no, it's responsiveness. Because if you asked your horse to stop or back up and it rears, it's not stopping or backing up. So it's a responsiveness problem. If your horse bolts, it's a responsiveness problem because you asked it to walk and it's running off with you. Mm -hmm. connection and relaxation come into it but they're not going to fix it if you do the exercises and lessons in my responsiveness module that's going to fix that very quickly and then you can work on the others to develop the quality of relationship that you want right that's really cool thank you I'm very excited and I'm you know it's actually even impressed me because you know when I started teaching it I started seeing the results like beyond I've ever seen before very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like, oh my God, this really works, you know, like better Uh than I thought it would. And even, uh, you know, Jesse Peters, you know, he's Mm -hmm. one of my instructors and he was at this masterclass and he looked at me and he went, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I said, I know. It's like people are reading the horse and knowing what to do. Welcome to my first commercial break. I'm excited to tell you about one of my favorite raincoat companies and one of my favorite people. Nancy Blystone has a fabulous raincoat company specifically made for equestrians. It's called Muddy Creek Rain Gear, 
And I love my raincoat. I wear it all fall, winter, and in Washington State, basically all year long. And I literally, I've told people this, when I put my hood on and I feel the rain on it, or hear the rain on it, it feels like I'm in a tent camping and it brings back wonderful memories and I feel happy in this coat. It is really comfortable to ride in. And she is just an amazing person who inspires other riders around her and is a fabulous businesswoman. So I would highly encourage you to check out Muddy Creek Rain Gear at muddycreek.net. I'd like to take a minute to share about a special virtual event coming up October 9th through the 30th called the Heart of Liberty. This is a three week virtual clinic that I've put together with the fabulous David Lichman. David is not only a master at Liberty, he's a master educator. If you've been wondering about how to get started with Liberty or you've been studying Liberty for years and you're interested in taking it to the next level, this clinic is not to be missed. Here are a few words from Jackie, a Heart of Liberty student. My goal was to reconnect with my horse. It happened so fast, like magic. Thank you. So I hope you will join us. You can find out more at davidlichman.com. You know, I was kind of like, oh my God, this really works, you know, like better than I thought it would. And even, uh, you know, Jesse Peters, you know, he's mm -hmm. one of my instructors and he was at this masterclass and he looked at me and he went, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I said, I know. It's like people are reading the horse and knowing what to do. They're just not doing, they're not doing techniques. They're going, I know what this horse needs and I know what to do to do that. So right. it's really exciting. That is really exciting. And even if, even if the only piece that you're able to see is I can see what this horse needs, but I'm not sure where to go from there, that can still get you so far because then you'll have the questions to ask. Um, and you'll, yeah, you'll be able to figure out the skills that you need by going to somebody like you or, you know, uh, somebody that's teaching the program. So yeah. that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. So thank you for asking me about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I'll, we'll make sure I'll make sure. To, yet again. <laughs> what's that? It's my life's work yet again. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I'll make sure to put a link to how people can find more information about the program. Thank um, you. That you're, that you're doing. And it's called How to Talk Horse, right? That's the curriculum, How to Talk Horse. And, and my website is Happy Horse, Happy Life. Great. So that takes it way beyond the curriculum. You know, there's learn with Linda, there's problem solving, there's brown confidential where people can like be a fly on the wall when I talk with my apprentices and protégés and we discuss problems and, you know, they share their learning experiences and people get huge things out of that. There's mind, body and spirit, which is how we cope with our emotions when we're around horses and, you know, whether it's fear or um, being too direct line or impatience or, you know, lack of goals. How do you, how do you work with all of that in your life? So it's, and then I've got some great guest presenters as well um, that contribute. So it's more of an activity center with a fantastic community in there. And then you can decide whether you want to do the curriculum or not. That's kind of an extra piece. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, um, I've admired you for years with your openness with sharing your own learning journey. And we all got to, many of us got to learn along with you with Walter Zettel um, when you were learning with him. Um, and then sadly he passed away a couple years ago and now you're learning with uh, Christoph Hess, one of the people you're learning with. And um, how, did you, how did you find him? Um, Walter told me. <laughs> said he said now my dear you know I'm retiring and I can't travel anymore and here's who I want you to study with so he passed me on to Christoph Hess that's great yeah I mean it was amazing because I I was going you know what do I do now you know right. and um and especially because you know people like Luis Lucio who's a really good friend he's in Spain so how am I going to study with him that was before virtual lessons were available right um, and even though Christoph was in uh, Germany and is in Germany, he came to the States reasonably regularly. Mm -hmm. And 
so then that's how that worked and you know we very quickly developed a professional a very strong professional relationship where he loved what I did and and how I um, thought and and you know about student my studentship and teaching and um, and then I loved how he teaches like he's one of the most positive teachers I've ever known and then he's so close to Walter in terms of the philosophy in in their attitude to people and to horses and I mean it was I was so lucky so that's, lucky that's yeah. wonderful um and he's helping you um further your education with dressage for those people that don't aren't familiar with him correct yes okay, okay. just the education director for uh, the FN, which is the National Federation in Germany. So he's very high ranked and he's also a very highly ranked international judge. Okay. Uh, he's not an Olympic judge, but he's, a, you know, he's one of, he's the next rung down from that. And uh, he's written a lot of the tests for like dressage tests for eventing and um, dressage is like a big passion. And so he's taught all over the world done seminars, does judges conferences, you know, he's very skilled. And that's great for me. I'm very privileged to be able to study with somebody like that. Because, you know, he's not going to fib to you. And, you know, if he says that's a six, it's a six, you know, mm -hmm. from an international judge. And if it's an eight, it's an eight. And if mm -hmm. it's a four, it's a four, you know, so it's wonderful, you know, because even though I don't want to compete, I want to be good. You know, I don't want to just you know, futz around the backyard and, and think I'm doing great dressage. Right. I, I really am passionate about doing it well and learning how to train a horse. It's the hardest thing to do to try to go to Grand Prix when you've never done it and you're training your own horse to Grand Prix. That's like stupid. But it's my journey and, it, you know, it's what I get and can share along the way that I really care about. Oh, I'm sorry about that. All right. That is really... Um, the most important and powerful, powerful thing for me in my profession, you know, because I learn so much by struggling. Right. And I can share it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you share the answers. <laughs> right. Right. When I finally get it. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, if I'd only I'd known it was, if it could have been explained this way, I might have got it quicker, you know? Right. Right. And your goal is to bring jazz to and you might need to help me with the terminology to the grand prix level mm -hmm. but not in competition just on your own and right. i i would guess because i think for a lot of us um for myself when i sign up for something and i don't compete but i've signed up for a couple of events or um workshops it gives me something to shoot for how do you um how do you keep yourself like what markers do you set so that you keep working toward that goal because that's a huge goal that takes quite a long time right yes i would say that i'm working on fourth level pre-saint george now um and there's pre-saint george intermediate one intermediate two and then grand prix so there's still another four levels and you know it's like they're pretty pretty testing you know you have to learn a lot and a lot of it has to do with the quality with which you can ride these things not just do the maneuvers because I can do quite a few of the maneuvers but the quality that you need to have you know is where the growth is and that right. it takes an extraordinary amount of knowledge and training so um, the good thing about dressage is that the levels are very well thought out and laid out mm -hmm. it's a very visible pathway so you know what you're shooting for you can see it not every sport has that but I think you know purpose and that's why purpose is one of my modules in that top tier mm -hmm. um, because when you have purpose it gives you motivation and it makes you better you try harder you you don't get bored you can struggle a bit more at times but it really is what gives meaning to what you're doing with your horses. And so, you know, whether your purpose is to get to get to a certain level in natural horsemanship or to uh, ride dressage to a certain level or eventing or reining or jumping or cutting or, 
uh, obstacle, you know, trail, competitive trail. There's so many different disciplines, you know, cowboy dressage, all that kind of thing. Um, it just gives you a, a pathway and somewhere to go. And then what my modules do is show you how to deal with all the core behaviors and qualities that you are going to encounter on your journey through your purpose. Right. So I'm not going to teach you the purpose, but I'm going to relate this model to your purpose. Right. So you're not necessarily, you're not going to be teaching the uh, Tempe flying lead change, but if someone's um, having trouble with a certain piece of it, like because their horse is tense or not responsive or those things, that's where you can then help them. So you, you'll help exactly. them with it. You won't necessarily teach the maneuver. Yes. And, and, you know, my, my big thing is to have a happy horse, you know, right. so a lot of people, they start competing and then they have horses that are tense or get unmotivated or, you know, can really get scared and there's too much pressure and that's what blows them up, you know? So through this mod, these modules, you learn how to um, mediate all of that so that you can compete at the highest level and have, have a happy horse. You know, there's some people, and even at the lowest level, you know, there's a lot of miserable horses <laughs> at low levels of competition right. or sport. Mm -hmm. And that's because people don't really know how to have a happy horse. And in my modules, it explains it. These are the qualities that will help you develop a happy horse. So I don't teach dressage. I don't, you know, I, I can teach maneuvers like basic things. But if people want to learn dressage, I'm not a dressage teacher. I will teach you about horse behavior. I'll teach you how to be a better rider. I'll teach you how to um, have a happy horse. I'll teach you how to have, you know, connection, relaxation, responsiveness, impulsion, confidence, um, bending, harmony, agility, you know, all those right. things, they all fit into whatever it is you want to do with your horse. Right. But they're things that are usually not explained to you. Right. You learn sport, but you don't learn how to manage your horse in that situation, even at Olympic levels, you know, there's right. people who don't know how to do that. I was helping um, a an Olympic hopeful um, on uh, one of the South American from one of the South American countries. Mm -hmm. And he's already been to, you know, high level competitions and he had this fabulous horse and he was destined for Tokyo. Unfortunately, the horse got hurt, but he said, you know, the and the vet, my vet is also his vet and recommended him to me. He said, I know somebody that can help you with these mm -hmm. behaviors. And I remember when he called me and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's a top event rider. He wants to go to the Olympics. He's already done, you know, all kinds of world championships and been very successful been to the Olympics also jumping. And um, I thought, you know, what am I going to teach him? And then I thought, well, I'm not teaching him eventing. That's not why he's coming to me. Right. He's coming to me because his horse goes crazy in the warm up arena, stands on its hind legs and jumps like this. And, you know, and I gave him two lessons and the whole thing changed. Wow. Yeah, he called, he said, well, I'm going to a competition next weekend. I'm like, you've had one lesson. <laughs> But the horse was completely different. I told him what to do. So anyway. can you share? Can you share with us what you had him do? Yes, I can. So uh, one of the the things because I said show me, and he's a, obviously a very good rider, and this horse is spectacular. I mean, incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. But he was very, it was a very left brain horse. He was a mover, a pushy mover, right? So um, what what um, Ronald would do was when the horse would start to get hyped, which was about five minutes into the ride, he would then start holding it back and trying to do maneuvers, but not fixing the tension. And so then I taught him to give one rein and to spiral him in and not pull backwards. And that horse started to change. And then the next lesson I gave, so I, you know, I showed him how to do the opposite and why what he was doing by trapping the horse was making the horse worse. And, um, and then on the next lesson, uh, that was already so much better. And he'd been to an event in the meantime and had great results. Um, but the second time I got him to do the parking spot, which is ask your horse to stand still without holding it. That horse could not stand still. He could not go from the arena to the barn without taking off. Mm -hmm. So after, and we took 40 minutes to teach that horse to stand still. And he was at the point where he went, 
Well, maybe because he's so fit and he's a high performance horse, he can't stand still. I'm like, right. no, he can stand still. He's right. just not learned to do that. And it's never been expected of him. Right. So it's going to teach him patiently until he gets it. And then he finally got it. And I said, now you're going to ride back on a loose rein. Well, the horse got to the gate of the arena and then went to take off and he grabbed the reins and I said, nope, spiral him in. So he dropped the reins. Thank God. Inventors are brave riders, right? right? He spiraled him down and I said, then give him a loose rein and go. And then he spiraled him again. And after three of those, that horse walked with his neck down to the stable and the guy's like, this is unbelievable. I didn't wow. know it was possible. So those are the things that are in my in my curriculum. It's like if the horse is not relaxed, then this is what you need to do. The parking spot is something you learn very quickly. It's in module two. Right. To teach horses how to do that. Um, because a lot of horses can't or won't or don't stand still. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't know that it's important. Right. And I use the car analogy. You've heard me talk about this. Mm -hmm where I say, you know, if you parked your car outside the store and you went shopping, you would expect your car to be there when you right. came out, right? Yeah. But we don't expect our horses to stand still on the end of a lead rope. Right. You know, we're managing them and like, oh, don't do that and don't do that. Or we kind of get dragged around with them instead of just going, park it. Right. And then the horse goes, okay. And now they can relax, they can stand still. You don't mess with them. It's huge. Right. It's so interesting. And it's so interesting too, like what you're talking about with this student, what he can do, you know, I'm sure I haven't met him. I haven't seen him, but from what you're talking about, he, the athleticism he has, the skill level he has is, you know, beyond. World class. Yeah. yeah. World-class. That's fabulous. Yeah. But those little pieces and that ability to go, oh, this is tension, which he could obviously see, but then being able to address it in ways specifically designed to deal with tension, not just, you know, let me get this done so I can get out onto the show ring and, and do the maneuvers that I, you know, can accomplish. And then we'll bolt back to the, to the trailer. Um, exactly. And, you know, I mean, most riders aren't taught how to train horses except to train the maneuvers right so when i talked to him i said you know if your horse had trouble with flying changes would you know how to fix that and he goes yeah and i said if your horse had trouble with relaxation would you know how to fix that and he goes no that's why you're here <laughs> oh, that's so interesting so i'm a horse yeah. behaviorist right right i'm a horse behaviorist so i'm an expert on helping to improve behavior and help the horse become happy instead of frustrated or scared or tense or because a tense horse is not a happy horse right. an unmotivated bored horse is not a happy horse you know a horse doesn't get to use its mind when it's really smart is not a happy horse and so those are all the things that i've put into the curriculum which is why it doesn't matter what level you are from world class to almost a beginner you can learn about horses um, and how to influence behavior in a positive way through this program. It's super inspiring. And it made me think of, um, I don't know if this is the greatest analogy, but you know how different um, athletes like golf and any, any sport, but I, I was thinking of golf, that you can learn the, the swing, you can, you know, all the different skills, but the top golfers, the people that do really well have coaches that help them with the mental piece. Cause as soon as that mental piece gets in there, it doesn't matter how much skill you have. Um, and like, again, like I said, like with any sport basketball, and so you're kind of the, that, that coach, that mental coach for the, for the horses. It's like sports psychologist, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's pretty much what it is. You know, I'm, I'm a horse psychologist a horse sports psychologist. Right. And you know, now you've developed, I, I know how to help horses with that. Right. And yeah. then like, there's one thing to um, be able to do that. Like you're able to do that, but then to take it and develop a way that other people like with your curriculum, that other people can learn how to do that. That's yes. really, really cool. So thank you. Well, that's, you know, that's what, thank you. And I'm, that's what I'm really passionate about. And, you know, when I'm coaching or, or when I'm teaching, you know, like in my master classes, um, I'll ask people, you know, why do you think your horse is doing that? Which module, you know, because they've got the words now, which one do you think it, it relates to? And 
that is the most important thing because if you can know what the cause is, then you can fix it. Right. But if you don't know, like I was giving the example about, you know, if a horse is rearing or bucking or bolting, it's a responsiveness problem. It's not a relaxation problem. Right. You try to fix it with relaxation techniques, you're going to be mildly successful. Mm -hmm. But if you know it's a responsiveness issue, and this is what I teach, then you can fix it. And that's, to me, it's not just knowing what to do. It's also making the right diagnosis that's critical. Right. Because that's why I get immediate results. I mean, that's where when I said earlier, you know, I'm watching people going, oh, my God, they're fixing their problems and the horses are not having issues. I mean, there were people that arrived. There was one lady um, brought this horse. She said, I haven't ridden it in six months because it scares me to death. And I don't care if I don't get on in these five days. Day two, she was on her back. Never look back. And I'm yeah. like, look at that, because she did all the right things to calm the horse down, have a more responsive, get more connected. Everything went great. Whereas before she was just controlling it and kind of saying no and trying to do, you know, different techniques that she'd learned through natural horsemanship. Right. But technique is nothing if you don't, um, if you don't know what you're actually fixing, you're going to use the wrong strategy, even mm -hmm. if it's the right technique your strategy is going to be off and right. and that's where a lot of people struggle for years you know I mean I I've had people tell me that you know they've been doing natural horsemanship for 10 years 15 years and it's the first time I ever got connection it's the first time I ever got impulsion it's the first time that ever and they've been doing this for years but didn't know because they'd not learned it there wasn't a program that really taught it that succinctly that's right. what I'm trying to do, is just be very succinct about it so I can really empower you to go, oh, I know how to fix that. Right. That's awesome. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm totally excited. Me too. Uh, so with Christoph, a while back, you had shared with me a little bit about what you do to prepare for a lesson. <laughs> can you share that? Yes. Um, in fact, I just uh, did a, um, a mind, body, spirit interview with my protege, Courtney, on this subject. And it's in my curriculum, obviously. And it's the difference between learning, practicing and performing, because they're very separate things and people muddy them up all the time. So when you're learning, it's a one time event. You learn something new. And it might take you five minutes, it might take you half an hour to learn it, right? To go, oh, that's what it is. Doesn't mean you're good at it, but now you understand what it is. But in that learning situation, you feel like an idiot because you go, well, I'm normally a smart person and, you know, fairly handy. And why am I, why do I not know my right hand from my left hand? Why am I, you know, it's like you just feel like an idiot. And learning is hard. Thank God it only happens once. Mm -hmm. So then after that, you're in the practicing and improving stage. And that should be boring. But a lot of people put too much pressure on themselves and on their horses when they're practicing. They act like they're performing. Oh, interesting. Yes. And I'm going to pull this back in a minute. Okay, good, good. Then, uh, so practicing means that you're steadily making little improvements every day, right? Every time you're doing this, you're getting a little better. You can now tell your right hand from your left hand. You can start to think about your horse as well as you and your movements get better. You refine it. You are better at whatever. Performing is pressure. And performing, like you can say, okay, it's a test. You know, you're going to do a dressage test or a jump course or a raining pattern or something like that. Um, so then in that situation, you've got a judge and you've got a, a pattern that you're having to ride and you're going to be scored and ranked according to the other riders, okay? So you can have a judge judge you or you can judge you. Like something I've always... Um, love to do is score um, my horse's response to something. So like, uh, you know, if I ask him to just, you know, wiggle the rope and back up, oh, was that a four 
or was it an eight, right? And I'm striving for sevens or better instead of just accepting twos and threes and fours and fives. It's like I'm scoring it in that moment so that I can improve it. But when you're performing is not a time to be fixing or improving. You just do the best you can. And after that, you analyze it and go, okay, well, that was awful or, oh, that was good and this part wasn't. And now that informs you for when you have to go back and either learn something new or you have to practice and keep improving something else. So here's what often happens. And, and I recommend that you only do that once or twice a month. Okay. Because if you and high achievers have a lot of trouble with this because they're in a performance mode all the time and it's very hard for them to be learners and it's very hard for them to to practice because they're always in this pressure performance mode. And even if you think you can't, you can take it, your horse can't. Okay. Right. Right. The horse can't. He cannot take that amount of pressure every day, which is why so many performance horses blow up. They don't make it because they're not taught how to just steadily improve everything every day is pressure no you have to be in this shape you have to do it with this sharpness you have to do it with this accuracy boy you know you've got to have some wiggle room and develop confidence and all the qualities that we talk about so what what i often see is that um, students have trouble learning because they come to a lesson in a performance mode i want to show the instructor I want to show the instructor what I can do and how much I've improved since last time. And I don't want them to think I'm an idiot. It's like, well, guess what? You know, as soon as you're in the learning mode, you're an idiot. So you better just accept it and go, here I go, right? I'm going to do this for this lesson. I'm going to learn that. And even if you, because your instructors and coaches can see it, as soon as you start doing something, they've already assessed it. You know, I know you do that. I do that. Like I'm looking at the horse and I see that already going, okay, that's good. Next level. So I'm not going to let you stay there and impress me. You impress me in five seconds. That's good. Now let's learn something. Let's move on. Right now you're an idiot. Instant idiot again. Right. right? I felt good. I was a little nervous, but I felt good because I could do this. But now, oh, you know, I'm, I'm pushed into that next, you know, level of incompetence. Right. So um, when it comes to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very good learner and I was a naturally confident learner. Uh, I don't know why, but I was. And I like from an early age. And unfortunately, that made me a bad teacher in the beginning because I thought everybody was a confident learner. Mm. And I had no idea the kind of strife and stress that most people go through as students. Right. And when I started studying with Stephanie Burns and Robert Kiyosaki, I was shocked to find out how damaged adults were as learners because of their early childhood mm-hmm. learning situations where they were pressured to perform mm-hmm. instead of nurtured as learners. Yep. That was massive for me. And Stephanie, I mean, I saw it in the seminars that I attended, but then when I was lucky enough to study directly under Stephanie's tutelage, Mm -hmm. uh, because we produced programs together and she coached me as a teacher while we were doing this. And she would say to me, Linda, what are you doing? And I'm like, what? And she said, you've got to back off, like give that person time to think. You think that you're helping them, but you're actually applying pressure. You think you're encouraging them, but you know, they're already, they're already full and they've got so much and they're emotional and you're not reading it. You cannot keep piling stuff on them. I'm like, wow. And then another one, which is one of my favorites, um, you know, there were people with horses doing things and, you know, I'm the teacher and I'm looking for somebody having trouble so I can go help. And I see somebody and I, I go to walk and I feel this finger in my collar. <laughs> and it's Stephanie. She goes, where are you going? And I said, well, someone says having trouble over there, so I'm going to go help her. And she goes, no, you're not. Let her struggle a little bit. Let her learn and work it out because if you go and rescue them too soon, they're not going to learn any kind of mental and emotional fitness. Right. You'll go in and tell them how to fix it. And now they have not grown in their ability 
to work through problems. And that's where people, because we know, you know, people get frustrated and they give up. Right. Well, frustrated and they get mad. Well, that makes you a terrible learner. You've got to learn how to manage that emotional fitness through your mm-hmm. learning process. And when mm-hmm. you can go, hey, I know learning is going to be hard. It's only going to happen for about, you know, 10 to 40 minutes. Think I can do that. And right. after that, you know, I can practice and gently improve it. Right. So that's what I do. I just go, all right. I, you know, there's no point trying to practice before a lesson. That's what I've been doing since my last lesson. And then he's going to see, because he's going to test me, right. ask me to do this, to do that. And he's going to assess if I've improved or not. And then he's going to launch me into a new thing. So when I go in, I, I, I just go, all right, get into learner mode. I know this is going to be hard. And no, I'm going to look and feel like an idiot. Let's go. Very cool. Then I don't get surprised. Right. One time I was riding with uh, Arthur Kotash, who I've known for many years, but he was the chief rider of the Vienna School, um, Spanish riding school in Vienna, very high ranked. And, you know, it's a very military style of, and he's very military when he teaches, you know, doesn't, he's not very nurturing, let's say Mm -hmm. that. I mean, he's brilliant, but he's, you know, he can be tough. Mm -hmm. And so he had just made somebody cry, you know, before I went in. And, um, and he said, and cause we knew each other anyway. And he said to me, so, uh, what do you want to show me today? Because that's often what people do. They want to show what I can do and then right. away we go. And I said, right. well, I'm going to show you that I'm a good student. He went, oh, okay. So I said, what would you like me to do? I didn't warm up my horse because I thought you might want to show me how you would. And, and away we went. That's great. Really cool. That's yeah. really cool. There's a quote that I'm thinking of um, that I think goes along with what you're saying about preparing yourself to go in and and learn and you're aware that it's going to be, it's not going to be necessarily fun. It's going to be challenging. You're going to feel like an idiot. Um, Adam Grant, who's a psychologist, he's an organizational psychologist. So he deals with businesses and and groups on how to uh, stay motivated and work together. And he's got this great quote, I'm not here to prove myself. I'm here to improve myself. Wonderful. I I know. I love that. So I try to remind myself when I go and do a lesson or I'm getting ready tomorrow to head to a clinic and, you know, to, to remind myself that I'm not, that's, that's not why I'm there. And I love the, the way you're laying it out. If someone goes to improve themselves, then they're in a performance mindset as opposed to a learning mindset. Um, and then leave the practicing for in between. Um, that's, that's great. Um, so you mentioned that a lot of people treat their practices as performances yeah. and it's way too much pressure. Um, how should it look different? Um, I, I think, well, the people that I've talked to about this where they've had the ahas and even Courtney, I mean, she's so wonderful because she's so open about her learning as well. And uh, when I said, you know, practicing should be boring, it shouldn't be pressure. She was like, oh, my God, I thought if I wasn't bringing it, you know, and trying my hardest and expecting this of my horse, then I'm not going to make any improvement. And so how it came about, and I know she won't mind me sharing this, was that, you know, we're here in Florida now, it's summer. And, you know, I'm very conscious of, you know, not having my horses be overworked and too sweaty and whatnot, um, even though you can't avoid some sweat in this heat. Right. Um, but, you know, I would look over at Courtney and her horse is black with sweat. He's a gray horse and he's soaked like her shirt is soaking wet. And I'm going, I think I did more than her and I'm barely sweating. And so is my horse. And so I watched it for a little while and it wasn't improving and her horse was starting to get chompy in the mouth and. And so finally we had to talk about it. And I said, why do you think your horse is so sweaty? And she goes, well, I don't know. I think because it's hot or whatever. And I said, well, have you noticed that mine's really not that sweaty? And she went, yeah. And I said, well, what is sweat usually in an indication of? And she said, oh, my God, tension, nervousness, fear. Mm-hmm. And so that's what pressure will start to do. It makes you fearful. It makes you tense and nervous, you know. And uh, so we had a fantastic talk about that. 
we've had so many great comments, people going, oh my God, that's what I do. And now they're changing the way that they're approaching their writing and training with fantastic results, you know, because now it's, you know, you go practice is boring. And then, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, you put a little pressure on and you do a performance thing and then you go, okay, take stock of that. Now here's what I'm going to work on for the next week. That's great. So the practice is more, you're just looking for um, some improvement. Yeah. And, and, and then moving on, it's not that you're looking for, like you're, you've already said, you're not looking for the performance. You're just looking for, oh, that feels better. That's closer to what the performance is going to look like. Let's move on. But it shouldn't be hard. Okay. Learn is hard and it's a one-time event. Okay. Practice is boring. If your practice is hard, it's like, oh, this is so hard while I'm practicing. It's like, you're not practicing then. You're taking too big a step. You're expecting too much. You're putting on too much pressure. You have too much expectation when you just got to just shift the dial a little bit, just improve that and go, yep. And if it's hard, you go, okay, I'm going to stop on this, do something else. And tomorrow I'll do a little bit more. Don't make it hard because then your horse is not going to want to show up. Right. That's really great. Yeah. And it, I love those three pieces that you're sharing because you need all three of them yeah. to keep progressing and yeah. keep things interesting. Right. So there's some of us that stay practicing. Yes. All exactly. the time. Right. And we don't get, we don't test ourselves with the performance and we don't go through the stress of learning new things or there's people I've met quite a few students that get I'm not sure why exactly they do it, but they, they learn, they, they learn new things and then learn another new thing and then learn another new thing. And maybe they aren't truly learning it, but they're looking for that one thing that's going to, and they don't practice. Exactly. And often they don't improve very much. Right. No. Kind of like they learn, 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 but not really practice and improve very much. And I've seen a lot of that, a lot of that. Yeah. So that's a great formula um, to have all three of them in there. Yeah, really good. Really Thank good. you. Yeah. Well, you're a member of my site. You should go and look at that. I think you'll love the conversations right up your alley. I will definitely, <laughs> I will definitely look at that. Um, I've loved those. The, the interview you did with the fella who swims with the sharks. David, yes. Yes. And how much, you know, uh, learning with the horses and what he's learned with you has helped him with sharks. Like, oh, I mean, I yeah, know. I yeah. yeah, really, I really interesting. So, um, thank you so much. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap, we'll wrap up here. Um, so I want to hear what's coming up. Cause I, I heard that you're going to be on the West coast. So can you share I- a little bit about that? Yes. I mean, with COVID, you know, of course, travel just kind of ground to a halt, which actually has been a blessing in disguise because it's allowing me to develop all of this. And um, I'm still not going to be traveling very much, especially compared to the way I used to. Uh, But I, um, my company is putting on a clinic over there with somebody who really wanted to bring me. Um, So we're doing a clinic. Um, I hope you have the dates because I can't think of them. I'll I'll put the dates in. Okay, like end of August, and it's a three-day um, happy horse clinic. So I'll be teaching people my curriculum. And usually right. it's the first three tiers that we touch on. The fourth right. tier you know, takes a lot. But as a, in a clinic, I can touch on all of those things, and then they can go home and, and develop it you know, by studying the curriculum. That's yeah, great. So and that's in, that's in California? Yes, it is. Okay. It's, it's near Pebble Beach. Okay. Very cool. And, uh, and then you're also teaching um, in person in Florida with clinics. Yes, I have master classes actually. Um, so there's one in October. There probably will be one in November or December. And then a couple in, in the, um, the new year. Lovely Florida winters. Yeah. Um, so yes, I just do a few master classes. And then most of what I do is online and virtual lessons and then produce all of this. So people, no matter where they are in the world, can study it. Um, And what else am I doing? Oh, and I'm just buying a new property, which is very exciting. And so I'll be putting on some programs there as well. Wonderful. Yeah. It's so exciting. It's very exciting. 
and people can find you on lindaparelli.com or happy horse, happy life, happy horse, happy life. I mean, cause if you go to Linda at Linda, Linda Pirelli.com, it'll just direct you to happy horse, happy life. And okay. also Facebook, happy horse, happy life. Join us there. You'll get a good taste of what we're doing and it's a wonderful community. And I'm very excited to be sharing this next level of information with everything that I've learned over the last 30 years from some of the best horsemen in the world. And uh, come join me. Let's talk horse. Wonderful. We're so blessed to have you. Thank, Thank you, Melinda. It's always hard for us to stop talking. And I, I know the conversation and the invitation to be on here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. The first podcast is a wrap. Thank you very much for being a part of it. These podcasts will come out every other week and I have some wonderful horsewomen and men to share with you. If you enjoyed this one, please share it with your friends and I'd love to hear from you. So feel free to leave a comment below. Last thing I will leave you with is please keep finding the bravery to share your unique gifts. We need you. Thank you.